We're continuing this teaching series through the life of Joseph. And I want to invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 46. As you're turning, there's typically two different types of people that we at least see and hear when it comes to Christmas. Uh, it is One is the, the givers. There's those that love to give. Uh, and then there's, on the other side of the spectrum, there's those that love to receive. And as I say those names, maybe some people come to your minds. You know what I'm talking about. On the giver's side, there's some that they listen. They're listening all year long. They're, they're taking notes uh, of what they hear that somebody, a loved one might need or want. I mean, it's really thought through. Uh, and then on the other side, you have some of, of the receivers that, man, they're just kind of waiting, waiting for that, that gift, waiting for the next thing. And uh, it's kind of a tragedy if you really consider it. Uh, but maybe you've given that gift to a receiver and there's like, oh, this is, this is cool, you know, kind of an attitude. Or, you know, it wasn't like that over-emotional, like, yeah, you know. Uh, and, and so in the same respect, in the same respect, it could be said that uh, there are those that uh, are blessed um, and those that love to be blessed. There's those that love to be a blessing and those that love to, well, be blessed. And so we're going to see in the text today how regardless of where you find yourself today, Thank God for his grace, amen. Uh, we are called as the church to be a blessing. We are called to be a blessing. Genesis chapter 45, just a quick recap before we look at chapter 46. In chapter 45, Joseph finally reveals his identity to his brothers. He finally reveals his identity Pharaoh tells Joseph to instruct his brothers to go back to Canaan and get Jacob and their families and bring them back to Egypt. Pharaoh gifts the brothers with wagons to go retrieve his family and bring them back. Pharaoh tells the brothers, don't worry about any of your belongings in Canaan because you will have the best that Egypt has to offer. Then we see what I would refer to as Jacob's struggles. Jacob's struggles. Consider just for a moment. Started in the womb. Jacob and Esau fighting in the womb. As they grew up to be men, the fighting didn't cease. <laughs> We've seen it throughout this narrative that there's a struggle, there's tension between Jacob. And Esau. And so there's, there's been this constant state of, of struggle. Then we've seen it very clearly that Jacob has struggled at times with the will of God. What is the right move, God? What is your will? What is your direction? Can anyone identify with, with Jacob? Any struggles? Now we come to the point where Jacob thought Joseph was dead for 22 years. Note the final verse in chapter 45, verse 28. Then Israel said, enough. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go to see him before I die. Look at chapter 46 with this in mind. Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba. He offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. That night, God spoke to Israel in a vision. Jacob, Jacob, he said. And Jacob replied, here I am. God said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. Verse 4, I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you back. Joseph will close your eyes when you die. Jacob left Beersheba, verse 5. The sons of Israel took their father uh, Jacob in the wagons Pharaoh had sent to carry him along with their dependents and their wives. They also took the 
their cattle and possessions they had acquired in the land of Canaan. Then Jacob and all his offspring with him came to Egypt. Verse 7, his sons and grandsons, his daughters and granddaughters, indeed all his offspring he brought with him to Egypt. And so we look at verse 1, chapter 46. Israel is the same name as, as Jacob. God had renamed him. And Jacob sets out to make this move to Egypt. He comes to Beersheba, which Beersheba is the lowest border between uh, the land of Canaan and Egypt. And what does he do? We see he offers sacrifices to God. What's happening in all of this? Jacob wants confirmation that this is God's will, that this is God's plan, that this is the right move. Why? Because his grandfather Abraham went to Egypt and it was a bad move. His father Isaac went to Egypt and it was a bad move. He comes to Beersheba. He offers sacrifice to know if this is the right move. That's probably a message, another message in itself. When, when, when you and I are seeking direction in life, what should we do? We should worship him. We should worship the living God. We should get on our knees before him. We should seek him. That should be our first response. Sadly, it is our last resort. I want to challenge us. When we're struggling with knowing the will of God, when we're struggling for the right decision, the right move, let's fall on our face before the living God. Cry out to him. Knock on that door until he opens it. Or it tells us, seek him and we will find him. So they come to Beersheba. Well, this isn't the first time Beersheba is, is mentioned. In Genesis chapter 21, verse 33, would you write that reference down if you're taking notes today? Genesis 21, verse 33. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba. And there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. Now, for some that might seem to uh, not be an important part. But this tree that Abraham planted was a, a sign of commitment, was a sign of faith, was a sign of worship as he calls on the name of the Lord. Now, tamarisk tree, it's said that they grow one inch Per year. Consider this. One inch per year. So as Abraham plants this, it's not one that's going to sprout up for his benefit. We'll come back to that. 190 years has gone by and Jacob finds himself in Beersheba. This tree would have been around 16 feet. If you do the math at this point. Isaac chapter 26 we see that he also visited Beersheba. Chapter 26, verse 23 says this, From there he went up to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him that night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your offspring because of my servant Abraham. Verse 25, so he built an altar there, and what did he do? called on the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. Isaac's servants also dug a well there. So Abraham plants this tree in Beersheba, calls on the name of the Lord. Isaac builds an altar. What does he do? Calls on the name of the Lord. Now Jacob finds himself before he enters Egypt, sacrificing to the Lord, seeking the Lord. Abraham planted this tree, knowing that he would never enjoy the benefit of the shade but he planted it in faith he planted it as a mark of of worship as a mark of sacrifice he knew whom he served and now his grandson Jacob will will, will be able to enjoy that place of worship Isaac comes along and he builds an altar we don't read in chapter 46 that Jacob builds an altar, then he worships the Lord. What we read is he comes to Beersheba and he offers sacrifices to the Lord. 
What is the meaning of all this? Here it is. Consider today. What are you passing down to the next generation? What are you passing on to the younger generation? What will be your mark of legacy? Oftentimes we're making decisions for the here and for the now and what benefits me. We see it a lot in parents even today. We're not thinking about how are we setting our children up for success and not just success in the world, but how are we passing on a, a faith to the next generation? Do they see a parent who is crying out to God, who is being honest before him, who, who is a, a man, woman of, of character? What are they seeing in us? What's the younger generation seeing displayed in us? It's an important message to consider. Our legacy Passed down to the younger generation. Are we setting up the next generation to know and worship the Lord? Are we setting up the next generation to follow the ways of the world? I would challenge us, church. What a time. What a moment. What a call for the church to rise up and pass on to the younger generation those things which will last forever. Now, if you were to ask me, did you have this text in mind, these thoughts in mind as we planned our Discovery Kids staying on the stage, singing away in the manger and silent night? I wish I could say yes. If you were to ask me, did I have this message in mind knowing that we were going to sell cookies <laughs> for Discover Youth to send them to camp next summer? I would say, I wish, but the answer is no. If you were to ask me, you must have considered this kids expansion project and this goal and this remodel and building on, adding on and all these details and as you're, as you're planning this sort of message, I, I wish it was on my mind, but here's what I can boldly tell you today, that it wasn't on mine, but it was on the Lord's. What a message, what a moment for the church to consider what are we passing on to the younger generation, especially with the end of this year approaching and 2024 coming quicker than you think. All the different goals that we will consider for the new year, all the dreams and ambitions, what part of that passes on faith to the younger generation? I would challenge you to prayerfully consider. Look at verse 3. God said. A pause. God said. I want to be very clear. Uh, it doesn't matter what man says or even what you say. What matters is what God says. And this is what God told Jacob. And I'm thankful that Jacob listened to God. Not the doubts that must have been creeping in his mind, but he listened to what God said. I am the God. I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you back. Joseph will close your eyes when you die. I am God, the God of your, God of your father. He says this. Do you see it? I will make you into a great nation there. Do you see that in your Bibles? I will make you into a great nation there. This is the same message that the Lord spoke to his father Isaac. This is the same message that the Lord spoke to Isaac's father Abraham. I will make you into a great nation. We see it in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing I will bless those, verse 3, who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I'm so thankful that Abraham decided. He had made that decision to follow the Lord. To be a man of faith. To pass it on to Isaac. And Isaac made that decision to pass it on to Jacob. That we can celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ coming from this family lineage. Verse 3. All pe peoples on earth will be blessed through you. What does that ultimately mean? Our greatest need was a Savior. Our greatest need 
was the Messiah. And he has come. But notice what the Lord spoke to Abraham. He says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. Did you see this? I will bless you and you and you will be a blessing. Not just I will bless you. Oftentimes we're just focused on all the, the blessings. God, what now? What next? What next? But, but we must consider that we have been blessed to be a blessing. The church, you and I are called to be a blessing. We have been blessed to be a blessing. Everything we have received from God is ultimately to be used for the benefit of other people, especially those who do not yet know him. Everything, all the blessings have been poured out upon us. We were taught as a child, count your blessings, name them one by one, count your many blessings, see what God has done. Oftentimes we, we fail to remember the promises of God and how he's blessed us. Our eyes turn inward, we allow the doubts of the enemy to creep in and what we really need is just to take a step back and a fresh perspective from God. One of the easiest, quickest ways to do that is to start counting those blessings that you have in your life. We've been blessed by God. Ephesians 1, 3 says, blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. Do you see that in Ephesians 1, 3? As a believer in Christ, you have everything that you need. Everything that you need is found in him. We have been blessed to be a blessing. God promises to Jacob, I will make you a great nation there. We'll talk about the there in just a moment, but Israel, modern day Israel is bordered by Lebanon in the north. Audra and I have stood looking at Mount Hermon. Lebanon in the north, we, uh, Syria and Jordan to the east. So we've stood facing Mount Hermon. We've seen Syria. We've driven past Jordan on the east, never been down to Egypt, <laughs> but Egypt is bordered on the south. Israel, modern day Israel is made up of 8,522 square miles. A little perspective, it's about the size of the state of Massachusetts. That's how small Israel is. And today, Israel leads the world in three different areas, citrus production, diamond cutting, and technology. And, and what we've seen is that God has surely blessed the nation and people of Israel. If you look back to chapter 46 of Genesis, verses 8 through 27, you will find a list of names. If you're expecting, perhaps... Make this your, your name book. <laughs> it could be wild. It all comes back, right? History repeats itself. Maybe not this far. But what we see in verse 27 is that at the end of this list, there's 70 persons. 70 people. 70 people. And as you look forward into the book of Exodus, what do we see? That what started as 70 people moving from the land of Canaan to Egypt... What we find in Exodus is that over 600,000 men exited Egypt back to the land of promise. Bible scholars tend to agree with the 2 million mark, 2 million, 2.1 million. So from 70, from 70 people to 2.1 million left Egypt under Moses. Today there's 9.8 million 
that live in Israel. Of the 9.8, there's 7.2 million Jewish people. From 70 people preserved because this famine had spread. No water, no animals, no life. But God preserved his people. And from 70 at this time to 7.2 million today. And what we've seen is that throughout history, the wickedness of mankind, the evil of mankind have tried to destroy the Jewish people. Would you pause and would you pray with me? And pray for the people of Israel. Lord, we come before you humbly. We ask your protection over the state of Israel. We ask for peace. Lord, we pray for, for those uh, that are most vulnerable, those that are innocent. We think of all the, the children and, and so many that are innocent and find themselves in the middle of this war. We pray for resolution. We pray for peace. We pray for strength. We pray for wisdom that all of those that are involved. Lord, we pray blessing. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Look at verse 28. Go back, go back to chapter 46, verse 28. Now Jacob had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to prepare for his arrival at Goshen. When they came to the land of Goshen, Joseph hitched the horses to his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father, Israel. Joseph, don't miss this, Joseph presented himself to him, threw his arms around him and wept for a long time. Time. Then Israel said to Joseph, I'm ready to die now because I have seen your face and you are still alive. Can you just imagine this moment? Jacob, thinking his son was dead, hearing the good news that he is alive. And that here's the wagons to bring the family so that this family doesn't die out. He sees Joseph. What an encounter that must have been. I'm ready to die now because I have seen your face and you are still alive. Chapter 46 continues with Joseph preparing his brothers to stand before Pharaoh. He lets them know that Pharaoh's going to ask, what's your occupation? And this is to be your response. We are your servants and we are shepherds. And so he prepares them. Then in chapter 47, verse 1, Joseph went and informed Pharaoh. He goes before them. He, he brings five of the brothers. They stand before Pharaoh. Pharaoh asks this question, what's your occupation? They share the response. We're your servants. We are your servants. And we are shepherds. And then listen to verse 5. Look at verse 5 with me. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, now that your father and brothers have come to you, the land of Egypt is open before you. Settle your father and brothers in the best part of the land. They can live in the land of Goshen. If you know of any capable men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. Are you seeing this with me? Look what God has done. I mean, this could only be explained by God. The goodness of God. Joseph has been entrusted to be the number two man over all of Egypt, answering only to Pharaoh. And now the brothers stand before Pharaoh, and what does Pharaoh do? He entrusts, he entrusts Joseph's brothers to oversee all of his livestock. Verse 7, Joseph then brought his father Jacob and presented him to Pharaoh. You see what happens next. Jacob blessed. Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many years have you lived? Jacob said to Pharaoh, my pilgrimage has lasted 130 years. My years have been few and hard, and they have not reached the years of my fathers during their pilgrimages. So Jacob, do you see it again? Jacob, verse 10, Jacob blessed Pharaoh, and departed from Pharaoh's presence. 
Then Joseph settled his father and brothers in the land of Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Verse 12, and Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's family with food for their dependents. Again, look what God has done. Look how good God is. Look how God preserves this, this family line. Look at the sovereignty of God over all things. Jacob stands before Pharaoh. And what does Jacob do? He, he, doesn't, he doesn't ask to, to, to try and understand the, the customs of Egypt or Egyptian society. He doesn't tell Pharaoh all that's wrong with the, the false pagan gods that he worships. In the practices, well, he stands before him. Scripture says he blessed him. He blessed him. I want to challenge you to consider the, wow, the people this week that the Lord is going to put before you. Those moments uh, when everything is building inside of you and you want to just give somebody the, you know, you give them the business. <laughs> Whatever that business looks and sounds like, then you ask for forgiveness. <laughs> but I, I want to just encourage you, challenge you with a different mindset. We are called to be a blessing. We are called to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one defender, and it's not you, it's the Lord our God. There's one rock for our lives upon which we stand, and it's the Lord our, our God. And I want to challenge you, church. I want to challenge you to ask the Lord to help you to be that blessing when people are coming towards you and maybe they're cursing. You would respond with a, a blessing. Or maybe they're doing things that are, are against the scriptures, a different standard for which you and I are called to live our lives. But, but you would stand on the promises of God and You'd be a blessing that they would see Christ Jesus living in you. You would consider the next few weeks as some people might gather in your home and you're already, you're already sweating it, a little bit of drama, a little bit of tension, maybe from Thanksgiving leftover, from last year leftover. And, uh, and you're kind of dreading it, but, but would you be so prayed up, so led by the Spirit of God, that those that you encounter can't help but see the living God in you. Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Psalm 67 verse 5 says this. Would you write it down? Write the scripture reference down. Psalm 67 5. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has produced its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. It's good news. Look at verse 7. God will bless us. And all the ends of the earth will fear him. All the ends of the earth will fear him. They'll fear him. I wonder what does it look like for you? Your, your, your perspective of who God is. Your, 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 your walking closely with God. Your intimacy with him. What does it look like? Your fear of, of him. Who is God to you? I pray that as we grow, each of us, as we grow in Christ Jesus, as we become fully devoted followers of Jesus, as we're all in, sold out to his ways, to his word, that the world would see him in us. We're called to be a blessing. Will you be a blessing this Christmas? Will you be a blessing this, this new year? We see that. Chapter 47, beginning in verse 13, the famine's very severe. It's not, it's not lessening. In fact, there were seven years, if you remember, seven years of abundance, seven years of famine. It's, it's, it's not getting better. It's getting worse. In fact, so much so that the people of Egypt, they're out of money. And so what do they have to give now but their lives? The people of Egypt said this in verse 19, buy us in our land in exchange for food. Then we with our land will become Pharaoh's slaves. 
give us seed so that we can live and not die, and so that the land won't become desolate. In this way, Joseph acquired all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. All the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. Then drop down to verse 25. This is what they said. You have saved our lives, they said. We have found favor with our Lord and will be Pharaoh's slaves. Look at verse 27. Israel settled in the land of Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property in it and became fruitful and very numerous. Again, they're in a foreign land. God has brought them to preserve them. But not just to preserve them. In this foreign land, they begin to thrive. Could it be that as you take a step back with a new fresh perspective and you see God's hand of provision and protection working in your life and in mine. It says they acquired property, became fruitful and very numerous. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. The Lord said to Abram, said this, know this for certain, your offspring will be resident aliens for 400 years in a land that does not belong to them and will be enslaved and oppressed. Not good news. Verse 14, however, I will judge the nation they serve and afterward they will go out with many possessions. But you will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age only this can be explained by the sovereignty of God. That the people of God would, would move from the promised land to Egypt, a pagan land. And that they would be preserved. And that they would thrive. And God's promises are always true. God always keeps his promises Verse 28 says, now Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, and his lifespan was 147 years. Uh, don't miss this last verse. For the first 17 years, Joseph was nurtured and cared for, protected by his father. For the first 17 years of his life. Now... The final 17 years of Jacob's life, Joseph will nurture, care for, and protect his father. Joseph, the final years of his father's death will be a blessing to his father, to his brothers, to all the family, the entire family. Sometimes in, in life, we, we just need a perspective change. The girls and I have been, we've been working on, a, on puzzles lately. Now, we're not puzzle people. We've never been puzzle people, but they picked up a puzzle at a thrift store, thought it would be good to put together a used uh, puzzle. And I will, I will say today that it's never a good idea to pick up a used puzzle because there's probably always two pieces that's really not the moral of the story. The, <laughs> the, the point of the story is this. As we've been working on this, this puzzle, and, and, and we probably should have started with like, you know, the, the starting kit or something, you know, like the easy one. <laughs> you know, like a like hundred pieces. We didn't do that. We're putting this whole thing out, and there have been so many times that I've had to tell the girls to take a step back. Because we're so focused, right? We're so focused on this, this, this piece. And why can't I just find this piece? I mean, 30 minutes have gone by and I haven't put two pieces together, you know? What kind of fun is that? Burn the thing down, you know? So we're, take a step back. And it's amazing. Every time we take a step back, we see the, the whole puzzle. And it's amazing that not just seeing the whole puzzle, but how quickly other pieces that we didn't notice because we're so focused. I wonder today what your life looks like, the things that are moving around you. 
I wonder if you would just take a step back today and allow God to give you a fresh perspective, a new perspective. I wonder if you will allow him to show you the direction for your life, the answers for your questions. I wonder if you'll allow him to take the, the hurt that you're feeling and allow him to heal you. Listen, church, sovereign God knows all things. He sees all things and he is in every detail. And I pray that you will not just know that, but that you would believe that to your core. When you take a step back, none of this makes sense. The whole narrative of Joseph doesn't make sense. You're telling me the best place for Joseph started in the pit? Then, then he was sold into slavery? Then he was sold into Potiphar's house? Then he was serving Potiphar in his whole and his entire home well and trusted. And then he was wrongfully accused and thrown into prison. And that's the best thing that could have happened to him was to be in prison, to get to know some people, some people get out. And he's known for being able to interpret dreams and, and the Pharaoh comes and, and he interprets this dream and he prepares Egypt for what's to come. And then Pharaoh entrusts him over his entire home. And, and then the famine reaches the land of Canaan, reaches the land of Canaan so severe that his brothers have no other choice but to come to Egypt to buy grain. And who's selling the grain but Joseph? Doesn't make sense. But our sovereign God, he sees all things, knows all things. You better believe he's in every detail of our lives. Will you trust him? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? All across this place, those that are joining us online, would you get alone with the living God just for a moment? Just get alone just for a moment. Would you take a step back? Right where you're sitting, right where you find yourself, would you just ask God, God, would you give me a new perspective, a fresh perspective, your perspective, <laughs> not just any perspective, but your perspective. As people are praying all across this place, online with us, uh, maybe you just need to list out one, two, three blessings that God has blessed you. He's poured out upon you. What's that one blessing, that second blessing, that third blessing? You've been so focused on the, maybe the dryness, the, what, what you don't have, that, that you've missed what you do have. Would you just list that out? What's that one blessing, that second blessing, that third blessing? It's easy after a long day to, even a long year, To miss the many blessings of God. So would you just count them? As people are praying all across this place and online, maybe there's someone here, someone joining us online that's never surrendered over to Jesus. And today is the day that changes everything. Today is the day that changes everything. I wonder, have you ever come to the point where you have made Jesus Lord of your life? Meaning you're no longer boss, you're no longer master, you're no longer running it. You're surrendering all over to him. The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And I wonder if today is the day of salvation for you. Is today the day that you surrender it all over to him? Today can be that day. Right where you're at, would you call upon, whether in the house or online, would you say something like, dear Jesus, acknowledge who he is, Jesus Christ, Lord of all lords, King of all kings. Say something like this, I, I am a sinner, acknowledge who you are, what you've done, to your trespasses against him. 
I'm a sinner. I've missed it. Born into sin. But you are the Savior. You are the Savior. Jesus, you are the Savior. Forgiver of all my sins. Lover of my soul. Then would you just say something like, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe that you came to this earth. You died on a cross. You were placed in a grave. And you rose from the grave for me. Our Savior was born to die. Praise be to God, he didn't stay dead. He rose victorious for me and you, for the world. Would you say something like, I trust in you fully. Take my life. Help me to live for your glory. As I have been blessed, help me to be a blessing. Help me to be a blessing. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and those that are in the house and We're going to begin to sing a song, and as we sing this song, I'm going to encourage you to step out of your seat if there's something weighing on your heart today. Would you leave whatever that is here? Would you place it at the foot of the cross? Would you trust God that he's working all things together for our good? Would you ask him to fill you up with faith today? Believe him. There's people both sides of the stage, someone online that wants to pray with you, wants to stand with you, wants to answer any questions that you might have, wants to help you with whatever your next step is. And so I'm going to encourage you as we sing to step out of your seat and move as the Spirit of God leads you to move. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. Thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness. Thank you, Father, for this message and and for the impact and the implication for our lives. Well, God, help us to not just help us to not just hear, but help us to do, help us to be doers. God, thank you for how you have blessed us. Thank you that everything we need is found in you, Jesus. You are our hope, our peace, our joy, our love. So God, give us a new perspective, fresh perspective today. We ask this in the name of Jesus for your glory.